Welcome to the Diversity and Inclusion on Air podcast. This podcast is a program of the American Association of Veterinary Medical Colleges Diversity Matters Initiative. The podcast explores various issues related to diversity and inclusion in the veterinary profession and provides the AAVMC an opportunity to offer ongoing diversity programming to our member institutions as well as all veterinary professionals. My name is Dr. Lisa Greenhill and I am the Senior Director for Institutional Research and Diversity here at the AAVMC. Ooh, we've got a good show today. <laughs> and I don't know if that was professional, but we will talk about that in a moment. Um, so today's show, we're talking about the construct of professionalism. And a big question is whether or not the construct of professionalism is inclusive. Now, when we look at the competency-based veterinary education framework um, that's wonderful, uh, amazing folks within AAVMC put together a few years ago, um, we see there is a, demo, a domain, uh, domain seven, that is um, devoted to professionalism and professional identity. Now, the competencies within that domain include ethical reasoning and behavior, time management, personal reflection, um, the ability to be a self-directed learner, um, career planning, and um, attendance to personal well-being and certainly the uh, well-being of your colleagues. Now, all really, really good stuff. No debate there. All very measurable. Good stuff. That said, now, when we look across institutions, um, and certainly not just veterinary medicine, but yes, we're picking on vet med because that's what we do on this show. Um, now, when we look across institutions and we consider what the hidden curriculum actually says about professionalism, it's a bit of a different story, right? Um, and so we see dress codes, we see restrictions on hair color, we see requirements to cover tattoos, we see restrictions on um, how we present ourselves on social media, and certainly other rules of engagement, shall we say, that really um, are designed um, to produce uh, someone, uh, a professional, a veterinarian, um, that uh, is a professional, right? Um, and so it's a pretty specific manner in which we conceptualize what professionalism looks like. So all of that other stuff is great, but on the day-to-day, -day, <laughs> when you show up, we are assessing hair, we're assessing clothing, we're assessing shoes, we're assessing how you speak, we're assessing all of this kind of stuff. And at the end of the day, that's really kind of the big kind of thing that gives us that impression of whether or not you are an ethical person, whether or not you would do practice good time management and engage in personal reflection, right? So um, on that day-to-day -day space, we're always kind of asking, does this person look or present as professional? So my question, and I love questions, is who gets to decide that? Where did this come from? What is this construct? Um, and how much of the construct is really about assimilation, right? Um, it's easy to consider the extreme cases of like, you know, somebody who has like the teardrop <laughs> face tattoo <laughs> or, you know, the follow on Mike Tyson face tattoo. Like, that's not what we're really talking about. Though. Yeah. So, you know, on that kind of regular, regular, yes, I have red hair today. It was very intentional because I'm a contrarian by nature. Uh, so I did it really intentionally just for the show. Um, so to kind of get in and dig around in this uh, topic with me, I've invited my wonderful colleague, uh, Amanda Bates, Director of Veterinary Career Services and Professional Development at North Carolina State. University's College of Veterinary Medicine, because we like long names and titles in veterinary medicine. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, I'm, I'm so happy to be back on here. I feel like this is my, 
annual biannual stop on the show because I think it's my third time. I'm I'm soon gonna have my own segment <laughs> on the show. So, but I'm so glad I'm so glad to be here and to talk about this topic with you, Lisa. Yeah, yeah. So um, we're looking for uh, some fun, and and I've also got uh, a lot of uh, good stuff from uh, some Twitter discussions I had over the weekend, and um, yeah, I've already said. Gee, I don't know if Amanda will be ready for a part two because I don't know how far we're going to get on part one. <laughs> okay. So let's dig in and let's start with trying to get our arms around what is the definition of professionalism. Okay, so we were talking about this off air and I, because I, you know, I have thoughts around it and I'm sure you have thoughts and we all have thoughts around it. And so I was like, well, let's start with the dictionary and what does the dictionary say? And I actually want to read literally what I read. And it says the competence or skill expected of a professional. <laughs> that's, that's all it says. I've looked for other definitions to see if it'd be a little bit more, you know, weightier or heavier or there are other parts. And it literally just comes down to competency and skill. You can do your job. Yeah, basically, <laughs> essentially, if you break it down, can you do this task that people assume by your qualifications that you can do? That's what it is. But I think like a lot of other words, you know, in any language, there's the definition of a word. And then I think there's the actual practicality and what it looks like when it's living and breathing in the world, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think you're right, just even in your introduction, when we talk about professionalism, yes, some of it is attributed to skill, but much of it is also attributed to appearance mm -hmm. and demeanor and communication and, and how you carry yourself in whatever your space or your industry is. That's where I think when many of us think of professionalism, that's kind of where it lies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, can you do your job and, you know, do you, it's not even like, do you look cool doing it, but it's like, do people kind of- How do you look doing it? And yeah. how do you communicate what you're right. doing while doing it? Right, right. <laughs> and so, so as a career counselor at NC State, how do you coach students and young, you know, recent grads, young professionals um, around professionalism? Like, what, what do you tell them? Yeah, so it's wild for me because I've, I've been in the career space for a very long time. And so I've worked with students across not just vet med, but across different industries. And what's really interesting, I think, being a career service person in this time frame is that we're seeing such a shift in how people represents themselves professionally across all industries <laughs> in a way that even when I started my career, like it's very early on, you talked about, you know, you know, even how you present yourself on social media. I remember what I used to say when it was just like Facebook and Twitter. <laughs> and then now I'm just, I, I, I am on TikTok. I see what's on TikTok. And every now and then I'm like, oh my God, now I got to talk about how you communicate on TikTok. <laughs> but I, you know, when I talk to my, my students, the first thing I say is, look, you, you are walking into a profession. It is a respected profession. It's one that's held in high regard, right? So irrespective of how you express yourself, you always want to express yourself in a way that you respect and honor the space that you're coming out of. Mm -hmm. Now, how that is reflected is going to be different for every student. And as you know, there's so many avenues in vet med that one of the things we would say all the time is, and I'm going to call on Dr. Amy Snyder because she's my comrade in arms, but we'll often say, okay, even when we're looking at how to dress, right? We will say, look at what area of vet medicine you're in and just level up according to what is comfortable for you. Mm -hmm. And the reason we say it that way is because, as you know, people come in all different shapes, forms, presentations, ideas, mannerisms. And, you know, it's not enough just to say, well, you should always wear pants in this situation, or you should always wear a skirt, or you should always wear a tie, or you should always look this way. Because for every student, it's different. Because the truth of the matter is, it's 2022, and we, we've always had the diversity, but we've not always had the diverse expression of the diversity. And so that's where I kind of talk with students to say, okay, what's, where are you going? And let's look at what's comfortable for you in that space to still show, okay, I, got, I need to be respected with what I do, but I also want to show who I am and, and be part of this, you know, part of this um, industry. So how do students kind of react to that when you're like, okay, so 
kind of you're kind of telling them, okay, there's a bit of a continuum here and you yeah. got to figure out where you are and what's your comfort level. But the continuum is here. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. how do they react to that? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's funny. Like I even think about when I started in this job and even now, cause I really am less about telling them like the types of clothing they should wear, which is, I can even see that change in myself. I think that that's where mentors and sponsors have also come in as well. Mm-hmm. Like, so I think that when whenever a new professional is entering a space, right, and I think this is for anyone, I think you need to first understand the ecosystem that you're in, right? Like just, I'm not saying that you need to necessarily change to fit into it. I think you just need to know what you're dealing with, right? Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. Because you need to know what is the expectation. So if you are going into corporate or investment banking, right? there was a very strict uniform, right? Although the wild thing is that uniform is starting to change slow. Like I, it's starting to change because one of the things that I think is so hard when we talk about professionalism is that these are all cultures. Mm. There is a specific culture to every industry someone walks into. So depending on where you are in vet med, there is a culture, right? Because these are all subcultures, right? If you walk into banking, if you walk into law, if you walk into education. And the thing that I think is hard for students is that if you come from backgrounds where you kind of understand the culture already or had exposure, it's not, they're not really the ones having the questions, to be honest. It is typically the students who are coming from outside the field or the students who feel like, you know, quite frankly, they come from communities where haven't been heavily represented, where they will ask these questions and say, is it going to be looked down upon if I do this, that, if this is shown or whatever? And, And you would be amazed how many students fit into that category. It's not even the students that we make typically, but it's quite quite a category of students, I would say. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, I I think that certainly a lot of us have been to conferences where, um, you know, uh, there's a couple of conferences that I go to that focus specifically on um, students from underrepresented backgrounds, right? Yeah. And I'm always like, I've learned to bring like a tiny set of scissors with me because like the young men still have like the little like thing <laughs> on the sleeve. Yeah from the suit jacket that clearly is like one of the first suit jackets that they ever had, yeah. right? Yeah. Or like the little um, closure on the back vents, the little X string and you gotta like, come here, yeah. come on, let me let me help you out. Like, I can't believe your mentor didn't tell you to right. you do clothing checks in the hotel, like, you know, to right. make sure that you're ready, right? And so, um, and, and, and that's something that over the years I've like, okay, I have to be prepared for that even though these students are not even interested in veterinary medicine, but I feel a personal obligation to these underrepresented students who are at this career fair, trying to figure out what their next chapter post undergrad is gonna be. And they clearly don't have, um, there, there, there is an absence of role models so that they know what this is supposed to look like. Somebody told them to go to Marshall's and go buy the suit jacket. <laughs> Right, right. Well, and and here's the thing. I mean, we could take it a step further. I think about students that I've had who very visible tattoos, right? Like, mm. you know, there's the there are those of us who have tattoos, which you would never know until we told you that we have tattoos. And then <laughs> obviously different generation, right? Okay. And then there are those of us who are like, we've got sleeves, we've got, you know, down our legs, we may have neck tattoos. And then I think you would throw into that piercings. And I, (laughs) this is such a fascinating question to me because some of this is generational too, right? What we define as professionalism is very generational. So that's, that's a subculture within it is right. So, and, and this is not to say that folks of, and older generations do not necessarily have, you know, or that they have biases or they may not hire or whatever, because quite frankly, I've met older, older veterinarians that, I mean, they're not very many that I've met, but I've met a couple who you'd be like, oh my gosh, you have sleeves. Like I would have never thought you had sleeves, but that's, that's kind of interesting. But some of it is really like, okay, we've got generations that are coming in who are used to expression a lot different than we've ever seen. Right. Mm -hmm. And then here's the added layer, because I'm going to bring it back to social media. And I, I really am thinking about TikTok with this. We, I would say in older generations, haven't necessarily been 
open about expressing ourselves and not just expressing ourselves, you know, how we dress, how we speak, but then being on social media. And, and this is what TikTok is great for. Cause I am obsessed with like all these young folks who do TikToks where they talk about a day in their life and their job. And they literally start it from their bed. And I'm just like, I was like, oh my gosh, like we can see everything, but everything. also it's kind of wild, but it's actually kind of interesting, which is how I learned about this cool black girl who works at Google in Atlanta. I was just like following her day. And so they are far more, I would say Gen X, not Gen X, but Gen Z. So I guess that kind of puts us at the end after millennials are far more expressive about their values, both vocally, both like physically, Absolutely. both in like social media. And so that's a huge shift now when we're talking about what does it mean to be professional because the lines are kind of blurred in a way that they've not been blurred before. Yeah, and then you add COVID to the mix, right? right? Now for clinicians who've been like, you know, hustling the whole time um, at the clinic, that's one thing, but for those who are not necessarily in clinical practice, yeah. um, you know, what constitutes professional dress code has right. changed a bit <laughs> during the last couple of years. And I, I'm certainly I'm not a veterinarian, but I am a professional. And I, you know, we started talking about our dress code at AAVMC as we were getting ready to transition back to the office. And I was like, well, I am buying some really pretty shirts because y'all are still going to get these leggings. Like, like I'm just going to dress them up. <laughs> like, I'm just going to dress them up. Um, they're going to be now my dress leggings. Right. Like, right. You know, a pair of like ankle boots. Right. <laughs> and so instead of like the slippers that I've been wearing for the last two years. And so, you know, this thing is constantly evolving. It's really constantly evolving. But at the end of the day, when we think about professionalism as a construct, yeah. right, as a construct, um, is it inclusive? Is professionalism inclusive? No, because it was never meant to be, though. Woo! Right? Let's go there. <laughs> I mean, here's I, like here's the reality, right? No matter what domain, and like I said, this is not picking on vet med, but no matter what the domain was, the folks who are now coming into fields and the people who are originally in the field who set up the cultural mores are not necessarily the same groups of people. Hmm. Right. 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 So for example, if you are accustomed to being in a space where people do wear suits, right? And you're like, you know, we expect that you go to meetings and you wear a neutral color suit. Okay. Well, you may get you may get students who come from communities where, and I'm like one of those people who come from communities like, okay, we'll wear a suit, but we like bright colors. So we're not going to do blue, black, gray, right? It's not weird that you got a tan or a, a purple or, or wear a fuchsia if you want to, like that lime green, like that's not going to be for, for, for that student's culture, wearing a suit of those colors is not, it's not weird at all. Right. At all. But if you're in a specific domain where they're like, we wear, we, we want you to wear a suit, but then there's this added all this other stuff that's unspoken. Well, how are you going to know that if you didn't come from those from those environments? Right. Right. So professionalism in itself, it's like, and you have to think about who gets to decide what's professional, right? Because I mean, here's the thing: we both identify as black women. Yeah, we know the thing with hair. We know the thing with hair, right? Where there's there's a concern about our hair in its natural state. And I've, and I've had students in my office, actually, I have had students in my office at NC State where, you know, I had a young man who was thinking about, um, you know, he was a pre-vet student. He was thinking about going into vet med down the road. And he was like, you know, I'm just concerned. Like I got dreads. Like, what does that mean? If I like, will I be taken seriously because I have dreads? I've had these, I've grown, and you know, it takes how long it takes to grow dreads. Yeah. Yeah. Does it mean that do I need to change my hair in order to accommodate to be taken seriously in this space? And, and the thing that I have to tell students sometimes is that here's the wild part. Like at the top, most of everything should be, are you competent and can you do the job? That's the first part. Now, 
we have such a shift in society that quite frankly, there just might be a kid or a family that's excited to have a vet that has dreads just because they've never seen, seen like they've never seen it, right? Or they might be excited to have a vet and she's got purple hair and she's got a nose piercing because that reminds them of their favorite aunt. And also, by the way, you're great with puppies. Like, right. so, so I was like, you can't necessarily completely change yourself to fit a set of guidelines that were not explicitly articulated to you or for you. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I mean, you know, when we think about kind of who develops this, so um, uh, I have a wonderful, wonderful um, colleague here, um, Swavia Polisetti. Hi, Swavia. Um, but I had her kind of do some background research on this, and we pulled a number of articles. There is a really interesting one um, from the Journal of Graduate Medical Education, and it talks about, I'm going to just read this quote real quick, the independent and self-regulating professions as we in Western society understand them, have their origins in Hellenic Greece um, and are derived from the guilds and universities of medieval Europe and England and emerged in approximately their present form in the middle of the 19th century. Their moral foundations are deeply rooted in Judeo-Christian traditions of morality. That's a so lot. that <laughs> a little leaves out, like, I don't know, 90% of the world. Like, I mean, it's just, you know, and I'm like, Good on Greece and Europe and England and yay, shout out. Um, you know, I'm not saying bash at all, but yeah. it is very, as well as the Judeo-Christian piece, it is very um, um, a, a way of kind of defining things. And if you also think about what was happening at the same time as this evolution of what um, and who professionals are, we're mm -hmm. also talking about a period of time where mm, colonialism, <laughs> What's just happening here, there, and everywhere, right? And so um, there is, you know, virtually hardly anywhere on earth that has not been colonialized. So this also, this idea of what is um, appropriate mm -hmm. was also exported. Right. And, and, and we still see the vestiges of it today. I went down a, a huge rabbit hole of trying to figure out where did neckties come from because uh, you know, from men and male presenting, mask presenting um, people, like I have no idea why you insist on wearing a little noose every single day. Like it is bizarre to me. And now they even have these clip on ones for adults. It's, I went down a big rabbit hole, but it turns out it came from like originated in Croatia. And it was really about like how to keep your coat closed because it was cold. Right. That's, that's actually And right. somehow <laughs> it is now like a part of, you know, this, this ideal of what it means to be, then the French got hold of it and, you know, fashion. Right. <laughs> yeah, at, at least the French made it fashion. <laughs> the French made it fashion. Right? And so, you know, but here we are, and there's now an expectation at the turn of, you know, the 1900s, like it became a thing. Like everybody has to wear a necktie. And, and, you know, what if you don't want to? Or to your point, what if the culture that you're originating from um, mm -hmm. is just not rooted in that? So, so again, leaning a little bit on our shared um, identity and history, like, so you can go to a, a traditional African-American church and see all of the colors of the rainbow every yeah. Sunday, right? Yeah. And yeah. one of my favorite hashtags on social media to follow is um, um, Kojic Fashion. <laughs> Love it. Like, I mean, it is like church fashion elevated. Yeah. Elevated. Everything. We'll just say that. <laughs> you don't know what church Kojic is, the Church of God in Christ, predominantly an African American Christian denomination. I feel like we have to do the cultural translation. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You don't know what that I means. mean, the hats are big, the dresses Kojic. are flamboyant, the suits are flamboyant, and yet they still follow a core. Uh, presentation of like, this is a dress, this is a suit. It might be multicolored yeah. <laughs> with a fishtail, but <laughs> and a six foot wide hat, but it's, it's, it's still, a, it's, it's, you know, yeah. it's still there. And so, you know, when we think about this issue of inclusivity and kind of where are we moving, how is the world changing, um, you know, this idea of of um, we really believe that these 
competencies are really important to the development of professionalism and professional identity. But then we also have all of this other stuff saying, but it needs to come in this package. Because here's the reality. We attach visuals to words, right? And so even when, when if you were to ask someone, what do you think X, Y, and Z looks like? What do you think a professional X, Y, and Z looks like? You have a visual. Often that visual does not look like these other groups because historically these other groups have not been included and or recognized in these spaces. So, you know, you may say, okay, it is in my mind that I think that a veterinarian should wear a button down shirt, a tie, you know, slacks and a, you know, an overcoat if they, you know, are, are seeing someone, but here's, here's the issue, right? That person may not identify as male, <laughs> right? They, they may not for a variety of reasons be comfortable in that outfit, right? They may not for, <laughs> for financial reasons have ever owned an outfit that they could put, if you think about, especially our students coming from lower economic backgrounds, or they may culturally just come from places where people don't traditionally wear that. And so, the, you know, but when we have a very strict, narrow view that takes it away from the competency and the skill and does not allow for movement or flexibility, because some things are preferences and we have to accept mm -hmm. that some things are, it's my preference because I'm comfortable with it. Not necessarily it is something that impacts this individual's ability to do this. So I can be dis, what's, what's the word? I can be uncomfortable with someone having two, you know, both arm sleeve tattoos, right? Right? Because I just, I'm just maybe a person who's like, I just don't like looking at tattoos and I don't like seeing, you know, people express themselves that way. But being able to see, you know, like if they're wearing their coat and being able to see, okay, they've got, they've got sleeves is very often because maybe, maybe the sleeves come to their hands. That's, that does not mean that, you know, I need to have a rule in place that says, well, you know, we can't have visible tattoo because does it stop them from doing what they're doing? Can they do what they're doing? Or is it, are, are some of these rules rooted around, this is what I'm comfortable with. This is what I've been taught. We've just been following this since the beginning, but the beginning was mostly white men. So I don't know. <laughs> we can't. Right, right. Yeah. I mean, it is one of those, like, there are these rules and not everybody knows what the rules are. Um, and, um, and, and the rules were constructed during a particularly exclusionary period. <laughs> Right. And so how, what does that evolution look like? So let's talk about some of the rules of professionalism in terms of, you know, again, we have these competencies and that's great. But what do we when when someone is interviewing, what are we looking for? Right. So what are some of those rules? Hair, clothing, language. Let's let's get into it. Right. Yeah. So I, I have one, I did ask for feedback. And um, so here is a message that I received from a, uh, a wonderful colleague in California. And she talked about, there was a recent article um, and it talked about how immigrant professors, um, non-white immigrant professors feel they have to act white in order to be considered professional. Now, what does that act white mean? Typically it's language, right? Um, it's language, um, it might be dress, um, it might be hair. Um, there's certainly a lot of things that they're kind of feeling like they have to leave outside of the office, right? They have to leave it in the car. <laughs> <laughs> right. and it's, it's also some tweaking, right? So yes. folks who have maybe a name you're not familiar with and then making it very, for lack of a better term, westernized or, or Americanized because mm -hmm. that makes it easier for other people to remember them or to say instead of just making them learn, you know, right. whatever their name is. Right. And just to that point, it is so easy. Like we, we don't appreciate how much we've conditioned, particularly minoritized folks on how to keep dominant culture comfortable, right? So I've had a lot of students who had maybe challenging names 
And I, um, I spent a bit of time on the YouTubes because they have lots of pronunciation videos. Um, the Google will do it. And, you know, and they're like, oh, you can just call me Jane, even though my name is not Jane. <laughs> and I'm like, no, like you're a veterinary student. And if you can say blah, 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 ology, I can learn your name. Right, right. Like, I, I can learn, I, like, that's the least that I can do. We've had to li- read literature with writers from all across, especially Russian names that I, my family's from nowhere near Russia. We can figure out how to say some of these other names. Yeah. yeah. Work it out phonetically. <laughs> work it out, work it out, right? So what are some of these rules, Amanda? What are some of the rules? The rules? Yeah, I mean, I think you, you've kind of hit on some of the big ones. So I think definitely language and how we communicate, which is, I think a very big thing, right? And how we how we say things, I think obviously in how we present, right? Mm-hmm. So in terms of what does our hair look like? And, and, and the funny thing is, I think hair you wouldn't think would be such a big discussion, but it is a big discussion, even if you are not a person of color, because it, you can be someone who is in the dominant completely, you could be a you know, white female, but you decide that your hair is going to be blue. And some, or, or you decide it's going to be blue and shaved in the back, <laughs> right? Yeah. So, so I think hair and what we assume, you know, what people's hair should look like, which to me, once again, if I've got a pet that is hurting or an animal, I do not, your hair color, if your hair color has any bearing or hairstyle on helping that animal, we have bigger problems than the fact that you've got Kool-Aid blue going on, like streaked in your hair. So I would say that's a big thing. I would say piercings, right? I mean, I, I think, and I also think it's the nature of the piercings. Sure, sure. Right? So, you know, I think most people are cool with the nose piercing and especially if you've got like the cute, you know, so uh, like it's, it's, people can handle that. I think that when you start to get some of the other facial piercings where people go, okay, so the lip piercings, I, tongue, they're okay. You know, we don't okay. see it much, right? Um, what's this, what's this one called? The, uh, yeah, the, the, yeah, the, the, right, the, the, yeah, right. The, the, yeah. <laughs> and then, and then if you've got more than one, right. So, so, so like if you've got one in each nostril, um, I think there, there is some reaction there, obviously in the, in the style of clothing, right. And, mm-hmm. and how you choose to express yourself. I think that then when you add our students, depending on where they fall in terms of gender identity, if they want to dress outside of what, what individuals think that they should dress as far as their fashion is concerned. I would also say, once again, tattoos is a big thing. So I would say neck, I would say like okay. neck and anywhere else that is really visible. visible. And then I think what's really interesting and in a different way, so we're talking about different subcultures and whatnot. If we talk about our students and how they express their religious identity. Mm, right? So yeah. we have a growing number, for example, of, of, of Muslim students, right? And, and women who wear hijabs, maybe, and even with other faiths and how, how they represent their faith, right? That mm-hmm. becomes a really interesting conversation as well in terms of, it's not, you know, it's not, it's not a shun thing, but then it becomes, oh, this person falls out of what I think a veterinarian is. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. And, and, and how am I comfortable with that? So I think that those would be kind of the big things around professionalism. I think also, you know, as we talked about social media, how you communicate really on these platforms, right? Is just, and, and, and here's the thing, I am not throwing stones at anybody because this is such a new thing, even for those of us who like teach students, right? Like it is such a new thing. And so I keep talking about TikTok, but I, here's the reality. If you are working with students who have graduated from undergrad in the last two years moving on, TikTok is so big right? And the way that they used to communicate and the way, and, and it is a great place for satire and sarcasm too. I'm not going to lie. I spend more time laughing. Some of our students are on there and I look at some of their videos and I'm like, yeah, no, they're right. Like I can't even be mad at <laughs> what they said was like completely legit, but like how we communicate in those platforms, because I think what, what's really hard is now as professionals who are mentoring these students, where our struggles got to be is 
These students have a right to communicate how they want. They are guaranteed their ability to say what they wanna say and do what they wanna do. But how do we not necessarily penalize them or, or take punitive routes because we yeah. may disagree in how they're doing it or in the way they're doing it? Because they've got platforms. As long as they've got a phone, they've got a platform. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, some great um, uh, uh, comments in the chat, and I'm also going to mention some stuff from Twitter. Um, so the rules can be quite different between rural mixed practice versus urban small animal practice. Great, yes. great point, uh, Dr. Snyder. Um, yes, yes. Shout out to the TikTok. Yes, I I also love TikTok. Um, my my goat vet looks ends up looking like a city slicker. <laughs> Um, there's somebody kind of talking about um, this idea of looking white, right? And a lot of times that's not overtly said, but that's kind of what's uh, meant, yeah. right? <laughs> um, that's kind of what's meant. Um, there is um, a wonderful comment from um, our colleagues um, um, in uh, the UK where, uh, let me find it, let me find it. Ah, uh, yes, right, right, right. Um, it's difficult to take seriously a view of professionalism that revolves around different disapproval if someone, if some folks are a bit sweary online <laughs> while other folks are um, engaged in public hate speech or sexual harassment and get a slap yeah. on the wrist, right? And so there's this also this idea of um, a bit of hypocrisy in terms of what we penalize versus what we don't, right? So you can kind of get, get, you know, to use social media um, and, and AABE slang um, drag because right. you know, we might've said something on Twitter or something else. Um, and yet, you know, that there might be abusers, you know, in the midst, right? That right. are just kind of, live and breathe and walking around without <laughs> consequence. I mean, that's the reality, right? Yeah. Um, and I mean, I, I saw a TikTok again this morning while I was working out and it actually included um, Steve Harvey. Um, and I can't say I'm a huge fan or not or whatever. There was, you know, whatever. It is what it is. But he had his TV show, his talk show, right? And he talked about how, um, I follow a lot of linguists, but I, um, but he talked about how when he got his show and after it had been on for a while, um, NBC brought in um, like a linguist and, and a, 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 a voice coach or whatever, you know, a coach to help him, you know, be more grammatically correct. And he was like, okay, but that's like his third show though. He <laughs> exactly. He's like, that's why he got be doing okay. That's why he got the show. Right. He's like, I, I seem to be doing okay. And so you want me to change and that's not who I am. And, you know, and I, I actually have reposted it on one of my other um, social media channels and, and I am personally um, committed to bringing more um, African-American vernacular English into my work because that is my first language. Mm -hmm. That's the language that you know, I talk with my friends and when I talk with people and, and it is, it has rules. It is a recognized language and not just a dialect. Right. And so, um, this idea that we have to have this kind of, oh yeah, but that's not proper English. And I'm like, no, it's not American standard English. Right. And also, so this has nothing to do with anything, but it's also kind of the same. So I, so French, I grew up learning, I'm learning Spanish. And part of the reason I realized Spanish wasn't that hard for me is that even in America, we even incorporated so many words from different cultures that I was like, I already know what that means because we already use it. And so even to your point, even with AAVE, there's so many words that are already part of it. And your point with Steve Harvey is really interesting because when I'm talking to our students, I talk a lot about brand management and how they see themselves as their brand, right? Because that's like, here's the reality. You are a person who is a professional who's going to be looked up to. You are going to be in the space. Many of you have an online presence. People are going to look at your businesses. And I say, okay, you just have to figure out what's going to be part of your brand as a veterinarian. Right. Mm -hmm. And if that's just you, that's you. Right. And I don't tell them what it, I don't tell them what it has to be, what it looks like. But, you know, there's we've got some students who they've got massive followings like throughout vet school. They built out like, they have built out some great followings with the work that they've done, especially some of our students of color. And and for me, 
there, there's, there's a joy in that also, in them being their authentic selves, because especially in a space where we're trying to recruit more diversity and expand out, they are actually making veterinary medicine look a lot more accessible. Oh, like cool. these, yeah. these don't have to be like, these changes don't always have to be seen as negatives. Like I think that with many of our students who have the maturity and, and handle the responsibility of being the only or the first or whatever, the way they are already aware in a lot of cases on how to carry themselves. But I think that as, as their mentors and as their educators, our role is just to say, okay, cool. You get to choose how you carry yourself. I just want you to make sure you understand within the context of where you're going, how it can be received. And, and if there's pushback to it, how do you feel like you want to respond yeah. in a way that is constructive? Constructive. Yes. Big piece. Yes. Yes. So there are a couple of other kind of rules that I, I want um, yeah. to mention before um, we move on. And that is, you know, that there are definitely some ableism um, issues here, especially for um, the very large number of folks in the world who are neurodiverse, myself yeah. included. Right. Yeah. Um, and and, um, you know, day to day, you might not notice, but um, there might be issues with how they engage with language, um, how, um, you know, cultural issues around eye contact or not, yeah. um, all of these kinds of things that really can be challenging and make people feel, um, feel less, less yeah. Than, yeah. Right? because they're just not sure um, how they'll be received. So we did actually um, uh, mention this as well. And it was like, you know, um, this person, I've struggled with this topic myself as someone who is not neurotypical, that leadership sometimes has a very narrow definition and being quiet in meetings can yes. be interpreted as not being invested or involved. If we define professional behaviors that make our profession better or successful, rather than how people see us, that would really lead to a very different kind of outcome and, and uh, interpretation. I agree because I think in the, especially more in the corporate world, we tend to say eye contact, you know, that firm handshake, like speaking up, doing all of this stuff. But the, the funny part is that for a lot of folks, that's not how they function. And also people process very different, right? So, I mean, now COVID's given us a great, has given us a great exit strategy because now we don't have to shake anyone's hand. So like for people who like were sensory overload, like that's actually like I haven't touched anyone's hand for two and a half years. I didn't have to, and I'm great happy about that. But you're right. I mean, like even with eye contact, right? And and not, I, I think not even just folks who are neurodiverse, but also folks who just come from cultures where we just don't stare people dead in the face when yeah. we talk to them. Yeah. 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 So um, uh, a question in um, the chat, what about professionalism, uh, the professionalism of punctuality and deadlines of encountered situations where following such rules is perceived as um, violative of expression thoughts? Um, so so yeah. with the question again, so about so, uh, punctuality and deadlines, yes. you know, what about the professionalism around those topics? So here's, I mean, here's my general rule, even when it comes to deadlines, I, number one, just manage everyone's expectations, right? Like if, look, some people are <laughs> time fluid. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'll get it done yes. when I get it done in the priority of when things are going to happen. Some people are very like, I need this by one o'clock. Here's the deal. I think that a lot of, a lot of things could be killed if we just have conversations up front right? Because you wanting something by one o'clock, is it that you need to have it by one o'clock or is that it just makes you happy to have it by one o'clock? Mm. Right? Mm. Because what's comfortable for you is not necessarily comfortable for everyone else, right? And so I, you're right. I mean, punctual, I, look, I grew up in sub-Saharan Africa. Nobody is punctual for anything. Like, yeah. like, like, like what we would call in the West, punctuality is not a thing. And let me not even say it's the West because I travel through Italy and they weren't they were functional on anything either. So I think it's me like too. A, I think it's like a German, like it's a very specific. So let me not throw all of Europe and with the West under the bus. It but might just be like a Germanic, like you know what I mean? Like a very niche. countries that are famous for making watches. <laughs> I know, I'm dead serious. And because when I got there and I went, oh, y'all are just like the folks I grew up with Sub-Saharan Africa. And they were like, We're not on time for anything. Yeah. I don't know why you 
So yeah. I, I think that a lot of, uh, some of this is managing expectations. And I think that if we have rules around things, we need to actually explain to the groups why they exist. So I'm not saying rules are inherently bad, but it's just, but just to have something where we haven't explained to like students why we do it, because we've been doing it since 1965. That's not a, that's not the way to do things. Yeah. Yeah. It's very much like this idea of like, do you want it done or do you want it done your way? Right. Right. Um, now don't get me wrong. I, um, uh, I grew up in a family where punctuality was like, we lay, you, you know, if you are there at the time that's supposed to start, you're late. Right. Um, and, and that, you know, there's a whole lot of reasons for that. There was some military right. stuff. There was some church stuff. You don't go, like enter the sanctuary after a certain period and blah, 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 right. blah, and all of this kind of stuff that just culturally for me in the home that I grew up in made punctuality and deadlines really important. Now, if you talk to me about deadlines, I'm like, whoo, um, my natural tendency is to resist. Right, <laughs> right, right. That's not realistic in the world right. that I live in. Right. <laughs> right. Um, but I also know that people are like, oh, well, you've got this amount of time to work on it. And I'm like, yeah, but I probably will be working on it in the 72 hours right before the deadline. Okay. Because I know myself, um, there's, you know, there is some neurodiversity there. And I know what it takes for me to deliver what you need at the level that you need, right? And so, um, and so, you know, I've had to really coach some people who I've worked with over the years that I'm like, don't worry about how just worry about the deadline. Don't ask me about it. <laughs> Don't right. like, leave me alone. <laughs> so, but so here's the thing, you're managing expectations. Yes. yes. So, so instead, should we be teaching students, look, whatever the expectations are, just manage them, right? So, so instead of saying, you know, you have to be someone who gets stuff done by this point, this point, this point, just make sure we're teaching them to communicate, say, if you're working with a client, you can expect this by this point. point. How you get right. up to that point, that's on you. Right. I really don't need to right. know right. that. Yeah. Um, you know, and I think that this is, um, uh, this also has to do a lot with um, well being. And we don't talk yeah. about it as, as much because, you know, a lot of professionalism and the way that we, again, the construct in terms of the day to day and what we think about it, not like these like wonderful competencies. I'm not slamming the competencies at all. I totally believe in them. Yeah, but yeah. again, it's the, the reality of the day to day requires a lot of folks, almost everyone, even if you're in dominant culture, because there's probably some identity that's shaking around in there <laughs> that is not a part of dominant culture that yeah. you have to leave in the car in yeah. the elevator, at home, um, that doesn't fit there, right? And so, um, and, that, and that over time is really, really hard. It's hard. And I wanna prepare this question about punctuality and deadlines. I would just wanna give faculty a heads up about what's coming. Right. So, um, so my daughter, she's in college, she's, she'll be 21 soon, but I really had the most difficult time when she was in K through 12, because like they, they give them a deadline for some, an assignment to be done, but then somehow like they can still turn things in like four weeks later and get credit. <laughs> And I was like, fail her. Like, it's just, you know, how is she going to learn? And then even in her first year of college, she still had professors that were, you know, they call it forgiving and like, you know, and that there's like, we want to assess the competency. And I'm like, yeah, is one of the competencies punctual? <laughs> <laughs> me. Um, because I understand that, you know, years from now, she is going to be in a system that has an expectation that this is, you know, turned in at this time and not four weeks later. Like, right. and, you know, there is a self, there, there's, there's a self-protection thing here too, because I don't want her to lose a job. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right. But I just need faculty to understand that's the, the cohorts are coming and and some professors even in undergrad have allowed this behavior to persist and i'm not sure that they're going to be ready they're going to hit a buzzsaw with some of you um, graduate faculty when they when they get there and so that's something to to really really con um to consider so we've got uh, about 10 minutes left and i want to talk about how easy it is to run afoul of the unspoken <laughs> rules of professionalism like it's pretty easy 
you can do that and not even know you're running a foul. Like that, that's, that's how easy it is. Because once again, if it, there's this unspoken list of rules and it hasn't been communicated to you, all of a sudden you find yourself, you can find yourself on the other end of a punitive measure, right? Mm-hmm. As a student, because you didn't even know that that's not the thing to do, but that it's even, it's even worse when that thing not to do is not written down anywhere. Yeah. Because yeah. it's one thing if it's if it's written in a code book or if it's in a syllabus or whatever, some kind of document, but if it's not even written, how do you know? And so, yeah, it's super easy. I mean, yeah. it's, I, and I think the more, the more marginalized identities or more outside of the box you are as a person, I think it's easier and easier and easier to do that. Yeah. And I think that, you know, one of the things that I don't think that people also understand is once you run afoul of the um, the unwritten, unspoken expectations around professionalism and there is, you know, some pushback, some punitive kind of conversations, even if you're not like demerit or whatever it is written up or whatever it is. But but there comes the critique and you know, folks are like, well, why didn't you know this? And I'm like, well, how would I have known it, right? Um, Then know that that actually is an invitation for passive aggressive behavior. Like it just is, (laughs) it is. We might not like it. We might say, oh, you should find more constructive ways of reacting, but- I mean, we're talking about students. That's not what happened. <laughs> right. Students are going to say, but you started it. <laughs> right. And then, and then they're going to go on social media and talk about how you started it if they're the right ones. So, yeah. Yeah. Right. right. And I mean, there are lots and lots of um, social media posts and some of my favorite, and, and it comes around every few months. And I'm sure, um, Amanda, that you've seen them. And it is like how um, certain groups respond or demonstrate resistance, right? So, so, um, and particularly in email and they're like some of my favorite social media posts and it's like, um, as for my TV. previous email, <laughs> i.e. I told you already. So why are we still discussing, are we doing like, you know, and it's almost like you need that, um, what is it? Key and peel anger translator. <laughs> right. No, I, 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 my colleagues will fully admit I don't go passive aggressive. I just go aggressive. <laughs> and I'm like, and this is what I said here. <laughs> yeah. Right, right. And so, you know, right. it, it, it does, it, it, it invites this kind of resistance because it's like you're, you're, you're kind of punishing or critiquing me for something that I don't know. And you're like, why don't you know it? And I'm like, well, where was I supposed to, it wasn't in the book. It wasn't in the onboarding materials. It wasn't in the code of conduct. It wasn't here. And, and hear me, that's not also an invitation to itemize in the code of conduct. (laughs) But That's not the right answer either. It's that it does create distrust and mistrust between parties, right? And the, and the sad part is, is that in both cases, they could be very meaning, you know, well-meaning folks who could get along and, and move forward. But it's just because an expectation was put out there that the other party didn't even know was an expectation. And then they responded in a way that was outside of the expectation. And that's how you sour relationships. And you don't want to see that. Like you want to be able to say, look, this is this is the way we do things. And, and if you say that, then it's like, well, why do you do those things? And, and I think sometimes what's hard is that if someone pushes back and asks, why do you do it? And you haven't thought about why you do it, not a, you know, it's not hanging out in your unconscious device. If you've never thought about why you do it, it can feel really hardcore offensive when someone says, well, why do you do it that way? And you don't have an answer wow. or you do have an answer and you realize that answer is not great because it actually doesn't fit right. for the person who's asking. Right. So, you know, as, as we really kind of start to, to wind down and we start thinking about ways of trying to figure out how to make this construct um, in, a, in a very practical way, more inclusive, I did want to mention a couple of other art articles. And there's one from Harvard Business Review that I just, um, there are just a couple of gems in here that I want to drop on you. And it, it talks about, um, it's called, do, do Your Diversity Initiatives Promote Assimilation over inclusion. And I think that sometimes 
um, the idea or the construct that we um, are have become a culture to with respect to professionalism is actually more about assimilation than it is about um, being truly professional. Because again, we said the competencies <laughs> are over here. Right. And so one of the things um, there's a, a couple of um, sentences, there's two sentences in here that I think it's really, really important for um, listeners and viewers to hear. And the first one is assimilation becomes a huge problem when the expectation falls primarily on the shoulders of those whose backgrounds are underrepresented. And these expectations for assimilation have been unclear or unspoken from the beginning. Yep. The next sentence is showing up at work without expending all of your energy to assimilate is a privilege. Yep. <laughs> mic drop. Really right? <laughs> and so, oh, mic drop. And so, you know, I think that we have to really be honest about why we have the rules that we have, what purpose do they really serve? Um, and how do they help students and emerging professionals, right? What is it that we're really trying to teach them? Is it that they need to leave all of their, you know, if they, that they can't be their authentic selves? And I'm not saying that everybody's going to show up with, you know, multiple piercings, the face tattoo, the neck tattoo, the teardrop, and like multicolored hair, but on the off chance that they do, there is a culture that that speaks to. Yeah, yeah. Right. There's a culture that speaks to and you might not want it in your clinic, but trust, there's probably a clinic because there's a lot of those people who have in Brooklyn. <laughs> right in Brooklyn. In Brooklyn. I know specifically every arts clinic. district in every major city around the world. Right. Right. So so what are some of the ways that we can think about how to make professionalism more inclusive from a practical perspective? I mean, I think it's just what you said. I think there's conversations that need to be had. I think we need to examine why we why we instruct the way we do, what we're teaching, whether it's our mentees or our students, what why why are we passing that information down? And is it still relevant in the world that they're going into? So I love mm -hmm. the fact that there was the mention between urban and rural, right? Yeah, this conversation looks very different depending on where you're going. Although, to be fair, we're also going on some stereotypes too, because there are communities that may be more rural that honestly, they don't care about the face tattoo, whatever, because they just love Dr. Jones, who just works really well with their schnauzer. So I think it's really those conversations and really examining at the base level, because so much of once again, what we're doing when it comes to unconscious bias, when it comes to microaggressions and whatnot, it is stuff that we pass down and haven't actually examined why we pass it down. And if it is, if we're passing down information and, and values that are not relevant to our students that are not going to help them do their jobs, then we really have to rethink about it. Because let's be honest, the clients of today now, yes, almost everyone's got a pet, but they are very much are millennials as well, Gen Zers as well, who maybe some of the things that we cared about and maybe other generations cared about, they're not going to care about their veterinarian, right? Yeah. They're not, they're not going to care that they have pink hair and a, and a nose piercing. They right. just want to make sure that they show that they love and care that for their animal in the way that they would. And so I yeah. think it's conversations that we, and they and they can be hard conversations. We may not anticipate that they are, but when you ask yourself, why do we ask people to present themselves in a certain way? And beyond the fact that it's like, well, this is just the way we've always done it in Atlanta. That's not enough. Not enough. Yeah. And one last thing. I mean, we've talked a lot about, um, you know, uh, Gen Z's and um, millennials. Uh, of course, I'm a Gen X and we always like the forgotten hey. generation. But, <laughs> but I think that I want to just spend one, you know, couple of seconds saying to um, Z's, Zoomers and millennials, like, there's also a lane for you all, because for those of us who are older, who have waited all of our lives, um, because we have been forced to assimilate, where we get to a certain place where in our, um, in, in our lives, where, you know, you, for some of us, like you get to a certain age, you care less about what people think, you yeah. care less about rules, you care less about a lot of things, right? And so we finally are stepping into our authentic selves. And so, um, you know, don't go around pointing like, oh, Dr. Greenhill is like a little too old to have like, you know, yeah. 
Ronald McDonald hair. Mind your business. Like, <laughs> mind your business. Like, I've waited this long, like, to, to do this. And, okay. and like, let me live, like, like, let me, let me be my best be, right? And like, let me just have this for however long I need to have it. And so I think that all of us need to have some, some levels of mutual yeah. respect, but those okay. conversations about what we as a community um, view is, as professionalism and what the continuum looks like, because it can't be like this, but what that continuum looks like needs to um, be defined and, and probably expanded as well. And so, yeah, awesome conversation. I'm still stuck on the Ronald McDonald hair. <laughs> I'm so sorry. That was my takeaway from all now, I'm just saying. But I, and, and, and this is only the last piece I want to say on this note, because I know yeah. we're out of time, is that you're absolutely right. And that there can be mutual understanding on both sides. And don't, if you're on the younger end, don't make assumptions about sort of your older practitioners and clinicians about what they're willing or willing not to do. I think if you have a conversation with them, you might be pretty surprised as yeah. to how much they're willing to meet with you and, and meet you halfway or wherever yeah. in this conversation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that we just need to, to, to really kind of peel back some, all of us need to peel back some layers, ask some tough questions and, and really provide some thoughtful answers. So um, thank you. Oh, one more thing. To the best serve clients and patients, a full personal expression is something we might reserve for personal time. Building trust with clients may require limiting our expression at work. No? So, um, based on my takeaway from this conversation sometimes right but 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 um asking people habitually to not be their authentic selves is not good for their well-being right and building trust with clients is not exclusively do the domain of suits uh um skirts uh natural hair colors um, it's not, um, you know, it's not um, as narrow, I think, as it once was. Um, and I think that we need to, um, I, I tell people all the time, look at your market and really go outside and look around. Go yeah. to the grocery store, go here, go there, go to, you know, wherever the arts district is and see, you know, what folks are looking like. And, and yes, they have expectations too. And if your toots buttoned up, they might not really want you either. Right. So I think that there's, it's really about kind of understanding your clientele, but um, yeah, I mean, full person, full personal expression. Yeah. But again, like if we're also expected to spend so much time, um, you know, less personal time and more work, then I gotta, I gotta let, I gotta let Lisa out so, to play sometimes. <laughs> A great question. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Golden, Goldman. Um, okay. Well, this has been so much fun, Amanda. Thank you so much um, for coming back on the show and having this really, really fun um, deep conversation with me. It's been awesome. Yes. I am glad to be here. I love the work you're doing. So thank you for always having me. Oh, thank you. Thank you. This has been another episode of uh, AABMC's Diversity and Inclusion on Air. Again, uh, Amanda Bates at NCSU. Thank you so much. Be sure to uh, subscribe to the show on your favorite podcast app and uh, be sure to like us on Facebook at AABMC's Diversity and Inclusion on Air and uh, look forward to our next show. Thanks so much for watching and thanks so much.